Continuing the discussion of Jon Snow's real name, Jon being the son of Rhaegar and Lyanna, it would be his parents' prerogative to name him. In order for Jon to be a full Targaryen, as in the show, named Aegon Targaryen, certain conditions would need to be met in order for this to be even a possibility. Elia would need to die before Rhaegar, as Rhaegar couldn't officially marry Lyanna otherwise. Polygamy is out of the question, and divorce is out of the question. Rhaegar would be willing to go against convention and name a second son Aegon, which has been never done before in the story. Alternatively, Lyanna could have come up with a name by herself, which might explain the confusion. The problem is that Rhaegar died in a very public manner at the Trident, or at least appeared to. In order to fake his death, he would need to disguise another in his armour to go die in his dead. That said, I do not believe it was part of a master plan to stage his own death and retreat into exile. It was only a contingency so that Rhaegar would not die in single combat with Robert Baratheon. The idea was that Robert Baratheon would be killed by whoever Rhaegar sent in his place. This would require a body double, or a glamoured individual, to wear Rhaegar's very iconic black armour, and since Robert took a wound, they would need to be a skilled warrior as well. When Rhaegar was seen to have died on the trident, the royalist forces broke and ran, and the real Rhaegar, if he was still alive, couldn't or wouldn't salvage the situation, couldn't stop the troops fleeing back to King's Landing, and he couldn't stop the sack of King's Landing. Thus, with the House Targaryen ruined, he would need to retreat into exile, assuming a new identity, after of course returning to the Tower of Joy, marrying Lyanna and naming John Aegon. Again, I would say that Rhaegar didn't have a master plan to fake his own death. We know this from Jamie's chapter. We see that Rhaegar intended to defeat Robert at the Trident, since one cannot call a council to depose Ares if you are dead. This may seem somewhat absurd, but you must realise that George often uses the trope of someone in someone else's armour dying in their place or fighting in their place throughout A Song of Ice and Fire. First, we have Ramsay and the first Reek. From Bran's POV chapter, we are told that it was Reek that was captured by Sol Roderick and Ramsay was the one slain. Yet later, we find out that Ramsay dressed Reek up in his own fine clothes and marks of authority and gave Reek his horse and sent him off to the Dreadfort to try and get reinforcements. This was a ploy so that Roderick's men would chase Reek down, since they put an arrow on his back. And as a result, Ramsay was taken captive instead of killed. Later, after Sir Roderick is slain and the Bolton forces broke the siege of Winterfell, Ramsay reveals a deception to Theon, wearing a fine suit of armour. During the Battle of the Blackwater, the ghost of Renly attacks Stannis' army from the rear, shocking the soldiers. Many fought for Renly previously, and as a result of their king supposedly returning to life, they switched sides again. We find out later, in a storm of swords, that with Sir Lois's brother, Sir Garland Tyrell, who wore Renly's armour and pretended to be Renly, returned. In the Duncan Egg novels, we find a Targaryen crown prince wearing a suit of draconic black plate, which does not belong to him, but his son instead. Prince Baylor is mistaken for his son Valar by Dunk, but several of Dunk's companions. As a side note, the crown prince Baylor was probably killed because of the decision to wear armour that wasn't his. Possibly because his brother, who didn't intend to kill Baylor, but may have had certain resentments against Baylor, favoured son Valar, seeing him in his armour, in the heat of battle, decided to crack him over the head, losing control. During Aegon I, which is Aegon the Conqueror's Wars with Dawn, when he was attacking House Toland, he mistakenly fought the Castle Fool, who was sent out as a champion for House Toland, embarrassing Aegon in the process. Sam, before he joins the Night's Watch, is humiliated by the Redwine twins when they dress up a kitchen girl in Hobbo Redwine's armour and have her beat him in the practice yard. During Ariane's queen-making expedition in Dawn, Aries Oakheart assists her by sneaking Marcella away, replacing her with her handmade body double, 
and himself with one of his own Lannister guardsmen dressed up in his own armour. Roose Bolton, in A Dance of the Dragons, has another man dressed in his own armour, so that if the Cranagman ambush his army on the way up the neck, he would not be at risk. When the Hound is taking Arya to the twins, Arya remarks to herself in her head that it would be impossible for Sandor Clegane to cover up his appearance wearing a helmet, especially if that helmet was in the shape of a dog. That helmet was taken up after Sandor's supposed death by first Rorge and then later Lem Lemoncloak, both of whom pretended to be the Hound. Since his armour was so iconic, people would easily mistake the wearer for the person who gave it its fame. And perhaps most relevant all, Lyanna herself, participating at the Tawny of Harrenhal in borrowed armour. This is most relevant since Rhaegar was the one who discovered her ruse. Thus Rhaegar would absolutely know of the possibility of this strategy. So fine, Rhaegar could just put a knight in his armour and send him off to fight Robert. If he wins, no one has to know. If he loses and dies, all anyone has to do is lift up the visor and check, and the jig is up. Back to the ships! Back to the ships! It was his cousin. A few things happen immediately after the killing blow, which may change this. The waters of the Trident ran red around the hooves of their destroyers as they circled and clashed again and again until at last a crushing blow from Robert's hammer stove in the dragon and the chest beneath it. When Ned had finally come onto the scene, Rhaegar lay dead in the stream while men of both armies scrambled in the swirling waters for rubies knocked free of his armour. Edited one, A Game of Thrones. And from the World of Ice and Fire. For despite his crimes, Prince Rhaegar was no coward. Lord Robert was wounded by the Dragon Prince in the combat. Yet in the end, ferocious strength and his first to avenge the shame brought upon his stolen betrothed proved the greater. His warhammer found its mark, and Robert drove the spike through Rhaegar's chest, scattering the costly rubies that blazed upon the prince's breastplate. Some men on both sides stopped fighting at once, leaping instead into the river to recover the precious stones, and a general rout quickly began as the royalists started to fleeing the field. Lord Robert's wounds prevented him from taking up the pursuit so he gave that into the hands of Lord Eddard Stark. The Fall of the Dragons, Robert's Rebellion, The World of Ice and Fire. The rubies are knocked out of Rhaegar's breastplate, the person wearing Rhaegar's armour falls into the river, and soldiers from both armies scramble to recover the rubies, possibly looting the corpse and trampling the corpse as well. If the body is damaged beyond recognition, even if Robert doesn't bother to recover the body for the, from the river, no one can confirm Rhaegar is dead, or even feel the need to check. Robert took a wound, after all, which means he couldn't immediately check, though he would have time later. Given the right set of circumstances, with Robert's disgust with Rhaegar's behaviour, he may be happy to leave him there to rot in the river, short-sighted and reckless as Robert is. He may not bother to check. And then there is the matter of the combat disparity between Robert and Rhaegar. At this stage of the war, Robert has vastly more combat experience than Rhaegar. The prince may have had the very best of education in combat. He, like Jaehaerys the Conciliator, might well have spent every available opportunity with the King's Guard, training to be a puissant warrior. But no amount of training can equal the experience in battle that Robert acquired over several months, even years of an actual war, not to mention Robert's physical power and his talented melee. The only question is, was Rhaegar wise enough to know this? Was he just the love-struck prince who, like Littlefinger, thought he could beat a bigger man, as was in all the stories? Did he think his training in education, in swordplay, from the best of the swordsmen in the realm, 
could in fact rival Robert's spire and size and talent for murder? Was the prestige that would become from putting down the rebel himself too much of a temptation for Rhaegar? Was perhaps the battle resting on a knife edge, requiring a desperate last roll of the dice, a gamble, slay Robert and end the rebellion there and there? I mean, the rest of his king's guard, who were acting as his lieutenants, may have been cut down in battle. But Rhaegar had to know Robert was in his element, and he was very likely going to lose this fight. Brienne, in a feast for crows, was told by her master at arms growing up that he had a friend who was the champion of the yard. Everyone knew he would one day be a splendid knight, but the very first time he went to war, despite beating his opponent down, he didn't finish him in time and his lack of experience and lack of a killing resolve meant that all his talent and skill meant nothing, because he flinched. And in A Dance of the Dragons, when we showed that young Griff, or Fagon as it was, was sparring with Sir Wally Duckfield, any time they fought with mace or blunted long axe, as Robert tended to do, Sir Wally's greater size would quickly overwhelm his charge. With swords, the contests were more even. It is certainly possible that Rhaegar could have won. Robert Baratheon had been an indifferent jouster, in truth. During tourneys, had much preferred the melee, where he'd beat men bloody with blunted axe or hammer. Cersei V, A Feast for Crows. Rhaegar's prowess was unquestioned, but he seldom entered the lists. He never loved the Song of Swords the way that Robert did, or Jamie Lannister. It was something he had to do, a task the world had set him. He did it well, for he did everything well. That was his nature. But he took no joy in it. Men said he loved his harp much better than his lance. To know his four, a storm of swords. Rhaegar was a skilled tawny knight, a jouster, but he had next to no experience in war. But in a slow, protracted melee, Robert would have the advantage. To this moment, the ability to glamour is unnecessary. With purely mundane circumstances, Rhaegar's death could be greatly exaggerated. However, it is a common component of the Rhaegar is still alive theory, so let's explore. We are first introduced to glamours, maybe, at the end of A Clash of Kings. After Jack and Hagar changes his face and hair right in front of Arya by magical means. Later, when Arya joins the Faceless Men in A Feast for Crows, we get this exchange. That's not how I meant. Jacken used magic. All sorcery comes at a cost, child. Years of prayer and sacrifice and study are required to work a proper glamour. Years, she said, dismayed. Arya too, A Feast for Crows. And later, Mummers change their faces with artifice, the kindly men were saying and sorcerers use glamours, weaving light and shadow and desire to make illusions that trick the eye. These arts you shall learn, but what we do here goes deeper. Wise men can see through artifice, and glamours dissolve before sharp eyes. But the face you are about to don will be as true and as solid as the face you were born with. The Ugly Little Girl, A Dance of Dragons. From this we learn glamours are a sort of illusion magic which requires many years to learn and much dedication. In Melisandre's only chapter in A Dance with the Dragons, we get further insight into the operational requirements of a glamour. The glamour eye in the black iron fetter about his wrist, the ruby seemed to pulse. He tapped it with the edge of his blade. The steel made a faint click against the stone. I feel it when I sleep, warm against my skin, even through the iron. Soft as a woman's kiss, your kiss, but sometimes in my dreams it starts to burn, and your lips turn to into teeth. Every day I think of how easy it would be to pry it out, and every day I don't. Must I wear the bloody bones as well? The spell is made of shadow and suggestion. Men see what they expect to see. The bones are part of it. Melisandre won, I dance with the dragons. She made it sound a simple thing, and easy. They need never know how difficult it had been, or how much it had cost her. That was a lesson Melisandre had learned long before Ashai. The more effortless the sorcery appears, the more men fear the sorcerer. 
and the flames had licked at Rattleshirt. The ruby at her throat had grown so hot that she had feared her own flesh might start to smoke and blacken. Thankfully, Lord Snow had delivered her from the agony with his arrows. While Stannis had seethed at a defiance, shuddered with relief. From this, we learn that it is physically costly to perform a glamour. Can place a glamour can be put on several people, at least two, as to swap their appearance. And the use of a personal possession of the character being mimicked greatly stabilises the illusion. Tangentially, Melisandre bonds Mansoadia to herself by means of a ruby set in a shackle. In Rhaegar's case, his ruby-encrusted full-plate harness would be the perfect bit of trapping in order for another person to mimic Rhaegar. Now, is there any indication that Rhaegar could have possibly known about glamours? In Sam's fourth chapter of A Feast for the Crows, we get this line from Master Aemon. Melisandre, most of all, I think. The sword is wrong. She has to know that. Light without heat and empty glamour. The sword is wrong. And the false light can only lead us into deeper darkness, Sam. Meister Aemond not only knows what a glamour is, he knows the correct terminology which the Faceless Men and Melistrandra use themselves. This is a specific recognition and knowledge of specific terminology. And this is relevant because in the very same chapter, Aemond is telling Sam that Rhaegar was in correspondence with Aemond throughout his life, even up to this late period in his life after his son was born. He shared my belief when he was young, but later he became persuaded that it was his own son who fueled the prophecy, for a comet had been seen above King's Landing on the night Aegon was conceived, and Rhaegar was certain that the bleeding star had to be a comet. Now if either Master Aemon or Prince Rhaegar knew what a glamour was, it's quite likely the other would as well. Thus, it is plausible that Rhaegar knows what a glamour is. The question is, how would he learn it? I don't believe he learned it in some magic scroll one day, when he was reading as a child. And given where the Rhaegar lives, and how much of his time would be occupied by his princely upbringing, he wouldn't have time to go to Barbas to learn from the Faceless Men, or go to a shy and learn it from Melisandre. Thoros of Mir, who did live in King's Landing for some time, doesn't seem to have that ability, so not all Red Priests can use glamours. Melisandre is described as a shadowbinder, so thus having access to glamour magic isn't outside her wheelhouse. Now one person connected to Master Aemon does know how to glamour, and that's Bloodraven. Brynden Rivers, the bastard of Aegon IV. During the Mystery Night, in the Night of the Seven Kingdoms, Dunk encounters this hedge knight named Maynard Plum, who turns out to be an agent for Bloodraven, but more specifically, we find from this particular quote that he seems to be using a glamour. This close, there was something queer about the cast of Sir Maynard's features. The longer Dunk looked, the less he seemed to see. The Mystery Knight, a Knight of the Seven Kingdoms. In a different exchange between these two, Duncan says, We'd all be bastards of the old King Aegon the Fourth, if half the tales were true. And then Maynard responds, And who's to say we're not? Later still, at the end of the Mystery Knight, Dunk looks for Sir Maynard, but finds he's melted away during the night. This happens just before he's summoned to speak to Lord Brynden Rivers. This suggests to the suspicious mind that Sir Maynard Plum might have in fact been Sir Brynden Rivers, in disguise and using a glamour, as Lord Brynden Rivers is a well-known sorcerer. Now the question becomes, did Lord Brynden Rivers, Blood Raven, learn the art of glamouring from his Blackwood heritage, ergo the children of the forest and the old gods, or from his relationship with Shiera Seastar, his half-sister, who was the daughter of a Lyseni sorceress. I am not the first to propose this, but I present to you that the children of the forest, at least their own green seers, have the capability to cast a glamour. The suspect, in this case, being the ghost of High Heart, this three feet tall, dwarven albino woman, with notably red eyes. The woman could not have been more than three feet tall. The firelight made her eyes gleam as red as the eyes of John's wolf. 
The dwarf woman studied her with dim red eyes. I see you, she whispered. I see you, wolf child, blood child. I thought it was the Lord who smelled of death. She began to sob, her little body shaking. You are cruel to come to my hill, cruel. I gorged on grief at Summer Hall. I need none of yours. Be gone from here, dark heart. Be gone. Now what comes next is rather important. I'll have my payment now. I'll have the song you promised me. And so Lem woke Tom seven strings beneath his furs and brought him yawning to the fireside with his wood harp in hand. The same song as before, he asked. Oh I, my Jenny's song, is there another? And so he sang, and the dwarf woman closed her eyes and rocked slowly back and forth, murmuring worth the words and crying. Thoris took Arya firmly by the hand and drew her aside. Let her savour her song in peace, and is all she has left. Arya ate a storm of swords. Now, if you do not know, Summer Hall was a disaster which befell the Targaryen family. It happened on the day of Rhaegar's birth, and it was the end of the reign of Aegon V, Egg, who is Master Aemon's brother. He became king, and became at some point obsessed with prophecy, and the hatching of dragon eggs, as Targaryens so often were following the death of the dragons. So in order to facilitate this, in a similar manner, as Daenerys does later and successfully hatches her three eggs, he brings together seven dragon eggs and his own family, the entirety of House Targaryen, all in their summer palace at Summer Hole in the Stormlands. Not much is known about the actual events of the tragedy of Summer Hole, but what we know is that there was a fire that broke out in the palace, burning it down killing most of them inside. King Aegon V, his wife, and most of his children died. Those that survived were saved by Duncan the Toll, the Lord Commander of the Kingsguard. Amongst those saved were Jehelis II, his son Aerys, his wife Rhaella, and Rhaegar, who had just been born during the chaos. We interpolate the events based on a fragmentary passage listed in the World of Ice and Fire, a tantalising page of Gildan's history, surely one of the very last written before his own death, hints at much, but the ink with that was spilled over it in some mishap blotted out too much. Blood of the dragon gathered in one, which probably is all the blood of the dragon gathered in one place. Seven eggs to honour the seven gods, though the king's own septon had warned, who knows what the Septon warned of, but as the Faith of the Seven was highly opposed to dragons, the warning that it would be a front to the gods, perhaps. Wildfire. Possibly an ingredient in the ritual was wildfire, the violent green fire created by the Pyromancer's Guild in King's Landing, which is known to be similar to Greek fire in the real world. It is incredibly difficult to put out, it burns on water, can melt steel and flesh, and all manner of things. It's a very dangerous substance. Flames grew out of control, so some reason, somehow, the ritual got out of control and everything burnt down. Towering, burnt so hot, died but for the valour of the Lord Command. Saying all would have died but for the valour of the Lord Commander, Duncan the Toll. This is from the Targaryen kings, Aegon V, the word of ice and fire. The new king had already provided the realm with an heir in the person of his son Rhaegar, born amongst the flames of Summerhall. Ares and his queen, and his sister Rhaella, were young, and it was anticipated they would have many more children. This was a vital question at the time, for the tragedies of Aegon the Unlikely's reign had trimmed the noble tree of House Targaryen down to a pair of lonely branches. Targaryen kings, Aerith II, the world of ice and fire. One thing we do know is that the ghost of High Heart was a dwarf that came to court with Jenny of Oldstones. Jenny of Oldstones was a low-born girl who married Prince Duncan the Small, who was Aegon V's first child and crown prince. Due to the this decision in itself had vast political ramifications that resulted in a lot of trouble for House Targaryen, however, and is a story all of its own. But we find out from Daenerys' chapter in The Dance of the Dragons, 
Why did they wed if they did not love each other? This is Ares and Rayala. Your grandsire commanded it, Jehoes I. A woodswitch had told them that the prince that was promised would be born of their line. The woodswitch in this case being the ghost of High Heart. A woodswitch, Danny was astonished. She came to court with Jenny of Oldstones, a stunted thing, grotesque to look upon. A dwarf, most people said, though dear to Lady Jenny, who always claimed that she was one of the children of the forest. What became of her? Summer Hall, the ward was fought with doom. Daenerys IV advanced the dragons. However, from Arya's chapters, in A Storm of Swords, we find out that the Ghost of High Heart did indeed survive. And her resilience and ability to travel unseen throughout the Seven Kingdoms, to travel all the way from Summerhall, down the Stormlands, up to the High Heart again, back in the Riverlands, wouldn't be a trip that an old, frail woman would be able to do on her own. This suggests that she is a bit more than she seems, and could in fact be a child of the forest, glamoured to avoid suspicion. Her red eyes are a particular feature which draws attention to this. From Bran's third chapter of Dance with Dragons, I thought the green seers were the wizards of the children. The singers, I mean. The singers is the name the children of the forest call themselves. In a sense, Blood Raven says to him, those you call the children of the forest have eyes as golden as the sun. But once in a great while, one of them is born amongst them with eyes as red as blood, or as green as the moss on a tree in the heart of the forest. By these signs do the gods mark those that I have chosen to receive the gift. The gift of magic. From the same Daenerys chapter, in this exchange we get, Yes, and Summerhall was the place the prince loved best. He would go there from time to time, with only his heart for company. Even the knights of the king's guard did not attend him there. He liked to sleep in the ruined hall, beneath the moon and stars. And whenever he came back, he would bring a song. When you heard him play his high harp with the silver strings and sing of twilights and tears and the death of kings, you could not but feel that he was singing of himself and those he loved. Daenerys four, A Storm of Swords. So I propose the following. The ghost of the high heart lost the person she cared most of all at Summer Hall. And while she did flee from the scene and she survived the wreckage, I propose that the intervening decades between Rhaegar's birth and the burning of Summerhall in 259 AC, and sometime during his adulthood, the ghost of High Heart lingered nearby. The stormlands are rife with forests, and even in the deep woods, some wee woods are known to linger. So the ghost of High Heart could have found a home nearby and visited Summerhall to indulge her grief. Children of forest live much longer, though the green shears have shortened lives. Could be that it takes her much longer to get over her grief, clearly so. Forty years later, she's still grieving. And we know that this woods witch in question was the one who proposed the prophecy of the prince that was promised, and Rhaegar at the time was the most likely candidate. He went to Summer Hall alone, without his king's guard of protection, with only his harp. We know from the Storm of Swords chapter that the Ghost of High Heart is particularly partial to songs done on the harp of her long-lost friend Jenny. Rhaegar's one defining talent was his skill with the harp. He was an excellent musician. Which means, if the Ghost of the High Heart would offer training in how to glamour oneself and what others, Rhaegar was in the perfect position. He had the one thing she wanted. Perhaps he performed the song so well it touched something deep within her. Or perhaps he even composed the song Jenny of Old Stones in the first place. Who knows? In any case, Rhaegar has the means and the opportunity to learn this talent. Dalla told me something once, Val's sister, Mance Raider's wife. She said that sorcery was a sword without a hilt. There is no safe way to grasp it. John 6, A Dance with the Dragons. Now, a counter-argument raised to Rhaegar having the power of glamouring is why didn't he use it during the kidnap of Lyanna? After all, if he could disguise his identity, no one would know that he had kidnapped Lyanna. So the process goes. The thing about glamours is it's a costly exercise. Melisandre was struggling to glamour two people simultaneously. Rhaegar was on the road with six of his trusted companions. 
whilst he himself would be incredibly easily recognised by most people. We do not know the identity of the other six for certain. One would assume that Sir Arthur Dane and Sir Oswell Went were among the two. Perhaps both of Rhaegar's former squires, who were trusted and held in high confidence. But the, these identities are, after all, purely speculation. The process of glamouring is only really useful if someone gets in close enough to recognise one's facial features. At a distance, simply wearing clothes and armour without recognisable insignia, plain clothes, would be enough to fool most observers. Even Rhaegar should be able to hide his silver blonde hair. Thus magic is both costly and unnecessary, if everything goes correctly. Furthermore, after Rhaegar's display at the Tawny of Howenhill, it is entirely likely that if Lyanna happened to go missing at any point in the intervening years, Rhaegar would be the primary suspect in any case. We know that Lyanna was taken within ten leagues of Howenhole, and quite possibly around the Inn of the Kneeling Man. Thus it would be neither necessary nor helpful to use a glamour in those circumstances. And there is always the possibility that Rhaegar wanted people to know he had kidnapped Lyanna. If he became aware of the growing coalition against House Targaryen, and figured he couldn't subvert it at all to deal with Ares, he may have seized Lyanna, if she didn't come along willingly, in order to provoke Brandon or Robert into premature action. Indeed, if that was his plan, he succeeded marvellously. Brandon and several other trusted companions were captured and became valuable hostages. It is only for Ares's madness that he executed them, and in too brutal a fashion, which provoked a general uprising. Seeing as Rhaegar is not dead in this theory, who is he now? What secret identity has he assumed? In A Song of Ice and Fire, most of the people with secret identities choose an identity that's very close to the original, possibly to make it easy to understand, or at least easy to remember from an in-universe perspective. Unless you're of course Varys, who's a master mama and can dress up as a variety of entities and assume different names and genders even. In A Clash of Kings and A Storm of Swords, we introduce to Arstan Whitebeard, who happens to be Barristan Selmy. Arstan is very similar in construction to Barristan. In A Feast for Crows, in the prologue, we introduce this character called Alaris, called the Sphinx, who was the child of a summer island and trader and a Dornishman. Though in the Captain of the Guards chapter, following Arrow Hote, we are introduced to three of the four Sand Snakes, Oberon's eldest bastard daughters, Obara, Nymeria, Tyene, and what is mentioned is Sorella, which you may notice is Alois backwards. We are also told that Sorella loves Old Town. Since Alois is studying at the Citadel, this further reinforces that the two are one and the same. In A Dance of the Dragons, we are introduced to John Connington, who has assumed the identity of Griff. Griff happens to be a shortening of Griffin, which is the family symbol of House Connington. Young Griff, who is Phagon, or Aegon Targaryen VI supposedly, is acting as John Connington's son. Later still, Mance Raider, after he is spared by Melisandre, goes to Winterfell and adopts the name Abel, which is a anagram of his favourite wildling king beyond the wall, Baal the Bard. One theory that's been floating around is that Oberon Martell didn't die in single combat with the mountain, but instead adopted a new identity as Kyburn. Kyburn was the chainless meister who was dismissed from the citadel for necromancy and other unnatural practices, went on to join the Brave Companions, this mercenary company, hired by Tywin Lannister. Oberon, in his youth, travelled to the Free Cities, learnt the poisonous trade. He went on to study at the Citadel, and forged six links of his chain before he grew bored and left. He soldiered in the disputed lands across the narrow sea, riding with the Second Sons, which is a mercenary company, for a time before forming his own company. Some speculate that the Brave Companions, the company of Vargo Hote, was in fact founded by Oberon Martell. 
They are hired on with Tywin Lannister, Oberyn Martell's sworn enemy, in order to sabotage the Lannisters from within. Oberyn employed a different person, a young ish warrior, to fight in his place and act on his behalf, whereas he assumed the identity of Kyburn in order to ingratiate himself with the Lannisters and take them down from within. Since Kyburn served with the mercenary company and was at the Citadel, and perhaps most notably, that they've got a very similar looking names, that Kyburn is in fact Oberyn Martell in disguise. We take the word Kyburn. And we find if we move the Q down here, the B here, the R, the Y, the N, towards the end, it looks suspiciously like Oberon. We don't have an E, but if we take the U and turn it sideways, we get most of the way there. And if we pluck the little end off the Q here and put it there, we've got an E. Take this with a grain of salt, of course. One particularly curious thing about Kyburn's depiction in A Song of Ice and Fire is that in A Storm of Swords, he's described as having warm brown eyes, whereas in A Feast for Crows in Cersei's chapters, after Tywin's death, he's described as having blue eyes, as well as a vaguely familiar face that Cersei could not quite place. Now, this discrepancy could just be one of George R. R. Martin's errors. They do happen from time to time, and he's not a perfect author. And for simplicity's sake, it's probably the case, but it may be a sign of something else. A discrepancy in the eye colour is common enough in glamoured subjects. You see that with Mance Raider in the Melisandre chapters. The wildling's own eyes narrowed. Grey eyes, brown eyes. Melisandre could see the colour change with each pulse of the ruby. Melisandre won A Dance with the Dragons. So what is Rhaegar's new identity? Jacken Hagar. Of course, as a faceless man, even this identity is entirely disposable. But Jacken Hagar of Loath is the most likely candidate to be the former crown prince. Working on the assumption that Rhaegar developed the ability to glamour, Jacken Hagar also has the ability to glamour. Those with a certain bloodlines may be sought out by the Guild of Assassins. Arya is one such individual. It could be that Rhaegar is another. Rhaegar, while a Targaryen, also has a relatively recent Blackwood ancestor. Black Betha Blackwood, who was the queen of Aegon V. And given that both Rhaegar's mother and father, as well as grandfather and grandmother, happened to have incestuous unions, this bloodline would be kept in the family pretty consistently. This is additionally noteworthy, as Bloodraven, who almost certainly has the ability to glamour, was half-blood Blackwood. Moving on, Jack and Hagar shows quite a bit of interest in Arya. Arya, who happens to be, for all intents and purposes, the reincarnation of his beloved Lyanna, receives, within his purview, as a member of the Faceless Guild out on operations, many really potent boons. Whilst the excuse that the Red God is due three lives that she saved from the fire, it may well be that Rhaegar has not entirely forsaken his former life and retains a fondness for Lyanna, for which her niece is a beneficiary. When Arya asks if Jack and Hagar would kill his own father for her, he replies that his father is long dead, as Ares is. Now, Jack and Hagar claims to be of Lorath, one of the free cities up north on an island, famed for its mazes. First, as a faceless man, this identity is, again, entirely disposable. Secondly, you may have noticed in one of Melisandre's quotes that while she is of a shy, she was certainly not born there. Firstly, because children do not live long in Ashai. And secondly, she mentions there was a time before Ashai, which clearly indicates Ashai was not her place of origin. Therefore, Loath might not have been Jack and Hagar's place of origin. And lastly, there is the name. Unlike Obu and Kyburn, it isn't so neatly anagrammed, but by rearranging letters, we are only short the last R in the name Rhaegar. 
the remaining letters, J, Q, and N, could be mangled in order to create an R out of them. The N could be bisected in order to create an R. The J could be rearranged to make an R. But in this case, we'll pluck the end off the Q and rearrange that into an R. And in this case, what remains? John. In my first video, I related the works of Frank Herbert to much of the Song of Ice and Fire. Martin's work is influenced by, and thus makes homage to, June. In fact, Paul Atreides is the one to name both his sons Leto, one following the death of the other. This is the only circumstance in which John would have been named Aegon Targaryen. Even then, it goes against Targaryen tradition, since even children who die young get to keep their names. The only other time in which we see two Aegons within a generation of each other is during the dance, wherein Daemon and Rhaenyra named their first son Aegon, probably to piss off Alicent. However, at the end of Dune Messiah, the second novel in the series, the Emperor Paul ends up in the following circumstances. Paul is blinded by a stone burner, which is a shaped nuclear warhead, whilst retrieving a dwarf who knows the names of traitors attempting to overthrow his rule. Despite this, due to the power of prescience, allowed in him due to the consumption and transmutation of the waters of life, and the many generations of selective breeding managed by the Bene Gesserit, he can still perceive his surroundings. Shortly thereafter, his concubine Chani dies following childbirth, delivering twins. Chani had been poisoned by Paul's empress in name only, Irulan, with a non-lethal contraceptive. She had hoped to force Paul into consummating their marriage. Chani consumes an unhealthy amount of spice to counteract the poisoning after it was discovered, resulting in pre-born twins Leto and Ganema. However, since Paul did not perceive a son, only a daughter, the confusion caused him to lose his prescience. Immediately following the birth, a third party makes a play for the throne. The Beni Talaxu, having gifted Paul with the Gula, a clone of dead tissue, of his family's deceased weapons master, a close friend, the Gula was conditioned to obey his creators and ordered to kill Paul, but the process awakened the memories of the Gola's former life, since murdering Paul would go against everything the former flesh stood for, and this turns out to be exactly what the Bene Talaxu wanted all along. Threatening Paul's newborn twins, the Talaxu face dancer, Sightail, an agent who, for all intensive purposes, is a faceless man, and probably inspired Martin in some small manner, tempts Paul with the potential resurrection of Chani. Seeing through the eyes of his son, Leto, he is able to kill Sightail. Bijaz, the dwarf, who is a Talaxu master, tries to bargain once again, but is killed by the Gola as revenge for being manipulated, and to spare Paul suffering. Given that Paul is now truly blind, and free of destiny, he decides to walk out into the desert to meet his end, by Fremen custom, as they do not tolerate the blind. However, he managed to survive, and return as a blind preacher, attempting to deconstruct the myth of Moedib, opening the way for his son, Leto, to find the golden path. There are several important elements in the story of Dune Messiah and Children of Dune, which I believe inspired George in his writing of A Song of Ice and Fire. The Kwisatz Haderach and the Prince That Was Promised, wherein Paul isn't the true Kwisatz Haderach and Rhaegar isn't the true Prince That Was Promised. Many generations of selective breeding resulted in both their formations of them and the true Prince That Was Promised as it was. Face dancers and faceless men share so much in common. Lorath, where Jack and Hagar is from, is known for its prehistorical mazes built by eldritch entities, but also the priesthood of the blind god Boash, 
a dissident sect of Valerians whom settled Lorath after leaving Valeria and the Freehold. They honoured their god by, amongst other practices, blindfolding themselves and practising self-abnegation, which ends up being part and parcel of the faceless men of Bravos, and is heard in Jaquin's Manoisms. Paul is blinded in Dune and pursues a similar self-abnegation in his exile, being freed from his destiny. Mayhaps Rhaegar too, having any faith in prophecy shattered, sought to abandon his identity and just deconstruct the lie as he saw it. There we later find out that it was not without merit, it's just that they misunderstood that a prince could also be a princess due to the gender-neutral language used in Valyria. The remaining elements worth considering is the unexpected child and the Gola. Perhaps Rhaegar was hoping for Hervasenia to join his Rhaenys and Aegon as Daenerys' muses. It would be difficult to judge the sex of a child by amateur means, but I might allow that a trained meister or midwife could, by experience, make a good guess at the sex of the fetus. But humans do not always think in a rational manner, expecting serendipity. I personally don't think it was twins necessarily. Though if Rhaegar and Lyanna were prepared for a son, they would have had a name other than Aegon picked out for him, as an Aegon already existed. Informed of Rhaegar's death by Eddard, Lyanna may have, in a moment of stress, chosen Aegon, or Rhaegar, presumed dead, made his way back to the Tower of Joy, and made the curious decision. Indeed, every strange corollary of this hypothesis I have mentioned herein is the minimum amount of explanation required for a John Targaryen to exist. So let's discuss the other name I mentioned. The Gola of the dead Atreides weapon master, whom sacrificed himself to ensure Paul's escape at the end of the first act of Dune, is called Duncan Idaho. The name Duncan is significant in the Song of Ice and Fire as well, in the person of Sir Duncan the Tall, the knight for whom Aegon V squired and was knighted by. Sir Duncan later joined the King's Guard and became the Lord Commander. Sir Duncan died, saving the few members of House Targaryen who did survive Summerhall. And Aegon V named his firstborn son Duncan, one of the two Targaryen princes to receive a non valyrian name, the other being Joffrey, named after this guy. So I have the following questions. For whom did Rhaegar squire? Who knighted Rhaegar? Did Rhaegar have someone else pretend to be him at Howenhall? And who might have rode out in his place against Robert? As you wish, said Whitebeard. As a young boy, the Prince of Dragonstone was bookish to a fault. He was reading so early that men said Queen Rhaella must have swallowed some books and a candle whilst he was in the womb. Rhaegar took no interest in the play of other children. The Meisters were awed by his wits, but his father's knights would jest sourly that Baelor the Blessed had been born again. Until one day, Rhaegar found something in his scrolls that changed him. No one knows what it might have been, only that the boy suddenly appeared early one morning in the yard as the knights were donning their steel. He walked up to Sir Willem Dowey, the master at arms, and said, I require swords and armour. It seems I must be a warrior. Daenerys won a storm of swords. It is not mentioned for whom Rhaegar squired. Indeed, as crown prince, being a squire is unnecessary for knighthood. He would be trained by the master at arms, Sir Willem Dowey, educated by Meister and Septon and Tutor until deemed ready. Aegon V was unusual, however. Well, I saw him twice or thrice, but I was only ten when Robert killed him, and mine own sire had hid me underneath a rock. No, I cannot claim I knew Prince Rhaegar, not as your false father did. Lord Connington was the prince's dearest friend, was he not? Young Griff pushed back a lock of blue hair out of his eyes. There were squires together at King's Landing. Tyrion six, a dance with dragons. If this quote can be taken at face value, which is difficult, understanding the nature of young Griff, but let's say it was, there was a time at King's Landing when Rhaegar and John Connington were both squires. Ergo, Rhaegar did squire for someone. 
As for who knighted him, that's also a mystery. Tywin knighted Ares during the War of the Nine Penny Kings. Rhaegar said he was knighted at 17, right before the tawny at Lannisport. This was during peace times. He could have been knighted by Sir William Dowie, or his own father, King Ares. Even Arthur Dane, despite being of the same age. As Sir Arthur was a friend and a peer. However, Sir Arthur is not a mentor. This seems unlikely. Rhaegar doesn't seem to hold Sir Bowston or Sir Gerald Hightower in his entire confidence, as neither was included in his party to kidnap Lyanna. The relationship between her squire and his knight is quite a close one, therefore it would require a great more confidence than either of these two seem to receive. John Connington was Rhaegar's squire after they squired together, therefore John Connington couldn't have been the one to knight him. So who did the sleeve? Now, Prince Lewin Martell was supposedly in Rhaegar's confidence, but he only seems to have come into the service of the King's Guard after Elia was married to Rhaegar. Rhaegar got married at age 20 and became a knight at 17, so it couldn't have been Lewin. For completeness sake, there's one more King's Guard in service to Ares named Sir Harlan Grandison. He was the King's Guard, which was the predecessor to Jamie. He is only mentioned once, in reference to how Jamie became part of the King's Guard during Jamie's own chapter, as well as once in the World of Ice and Fire. Now, in one of Brienne's chapters, at the end of A Feast for Crows, she visits the Quiet Isle, this religious community located along the Trident. It is downstream of where the Battle of the Trident took place, and due to the War of the Five Kings, items lost in the river, as well as dead bodies, tend to wash up there, and they've been receiving driftwood and flotsam for years. From the Battle of the Trident, when Rhaegar fought Robert, we are blessed here, where the river meets the bay, the currents and the tides wrestle, one against the other, and many strange and wondrous things are pushed towards us to wash up on our shores. Driftwood is the least of it. We have found silver cups and iron pots, sacks of wool and bolts of silk, rusted helms and shining swords, and I, rubies. That interested Sir Hyle, Rhaegar's rubies? It may be. Who can say? The battle was long leagues from here, but the river is tireless and patient. Six have been found. We are all waiting for the seventh. We end six, a feast for crows. You will recall the rubies that were knocked out of Rhaegar's breastplate when Robert smashed it with his warhammer. Given this is a religious community, seven is a holy number to them, thus they'll be waiting for seven. Given some were snatched up by soldiers on both sides of the battle, more were knocked out than just the seven. This is the literal interpretation of this line, but there is a metaphorical interpretation which some have brought up, that the six and seven they are referring to are that of the King's Guard. In a meta sense, six of Rhaegar's King's Guard have been accounted for, the seventh hasn't. Some think this means Jaime hasn't been accounted for, since Jaime still lives. However, Sir Bowston still lives, so this doesn't track. In the series, so far, we have had the fates of six of the seven King's Guard described to us before this particular quote. Jamie slew Ares and was pardoned by Robert. Sir Bowston was wounded at the Battle of the Trident and was pardoned by Robert. Sir Arthur, Sir Oswell went, and Sir Gerald Hightower met their fates at the Tower of Joy, either by death or perhaps by anonymity and exile, depending on which way you sway on that. Early in A Feast for Crows, it is finally revealed how Prince Lewin died. Prince Lewin Martell met his end at the hands of Lynn Corbray, wielding the Lady Forlorn, Corbray family Valyrian steel sword. The seventh King's Guard, whose fate hasn't been detailed to us, is Sir Jonathor Darry. Now, yes, in the World of Ice and Fire, it is said that he was cut down during the Battle of the Trident, and we know that he was one of the three King's Guard to accompany Rhaegar to that battle. So Jonathor Dowie is not mentioned all that much during the series. 
Besides standing outside the room with Jamie while Ares is visiting with Rayella after burning one of his hands, and after hearing Rayella suffering at Ares' hands due to his unrestrained lust, he asks the Jonathan Dowie if it's within their rights to defend her as well. John Dowie informs Jamie that yes, they are, their job is to protect her, but not from him. Besides that, when Rhaegar is leaving for the Trident, and Jamie protests his role, Jonathan Dowie tells him to do his duty. He is described by Jamie as an earnest man, but aside from that, we know precious little about the individual. It is not mentioned whether he participated in tournaments, nor any famous acts in his service to the king, besides that he rode with Sir Bowston to rally what remains of John Connington's forces after the Battle of the Bells. And we know nothing of what he looks like. In fact, the Hall of House Dowie has never once been described during the whole novels. We can infer what they perhaps look like from the surrounding houses, but we won't know for certain. Here are my thoughts on what could be the case with Sir Jonathan Dowie. Since he is the brother of Sir Willem Dowie, the master at arms in the Red Keep during Rhaegar's childhood, Sir Jonathan was likely there during Rhaegar's childhood. Not quite so old as Sir Bowston and Sir Gerald Hightower, but not so young as Sir Arthur Dane and Sir Oswald Went. Now, none of House Dowey is described physically during the novels. However, they are an ancient first man house which has dwelt along the Trident, and they are located rather close to Howenhall. Howenhall was the seat of House Went, that's Sir Oswell's house, but before that was the seat of House Loston. The most famous member of House Loston is Mad Donnell Loston, the lady who was thought to be a sorceress, an ally of Bloodraven. She was noted for having red hair. We can also infer that House Went was known for the, their red hair. We know this because Minessa Went was Catelyn and Lysa and Edmure's mother from House Went. She was the one who they inherited their red hair from. Hoster Tully, their father, was brown-haired in his youth. Again, given the proximity of How and Hell to Dowie, it is not unlikely that there was admixture between these two houses, these two castles. And whilst it's not described, it's impossible for Jonathan Dowie, as a result, to have red hair. Though it is never mentioned, of course. The other attribute you would expect to find amongst the River Lords, I mean, especially amongst Catelyn and her siblings, is the deep blue eyes, which also gets transferred on to Rob and Sansa and the like. This is my way of saying that Jonathan Dowie may have had red hair and blue eyes. Deep blue eyes. This is relevant because Rhaegar's eyes, at least in the House of the Undying Vision, are described as indigo. For those of you who don't know, indigo is the seventh colour in the rainbow, as described by Sir Isaac Newton. The thing about indigo is it doesn't exist. It is a made-up colour, though this is of course debatable, that exists between blue and purple. There was religious and cultic reasons for this, as seven was considered a holy number, whereas six, if you disregard indigo, was considered the devil's number. And it wouldn't do to remind everyone that light belongs to the devil, even if Lucifer means light bringer. So in a practical sense, indigo could well appear to be blue under certain lights and purple under others, much like Edric Dane. Now when Rhaegar is wearing his helmet and armour, you're not going to be able to see his hair, but you may be able to see his eyes. A general passerby might be able to notice he has blue eyes or perhaps purple, depending on the light. And if you replace him with Jonathan Dowie, who has similarly dark eyes, or might have similarly dark eyes, it could be the two could be mistaken if one wears the other's armour. Thus I finally present to you that if Rhaegar did substitute someone in his place to go fight Robert, it was Sir John. What other reason do I think this could be the case? If we look at Jack and Hagar's appearance, you notice the peculiar thing about him is that he has hair split into two different colours. Of course this could be dyed in the nature of the Tairoshi, though he is from Loath, supposedly. But on one side, he has white hair, which could be like the Targaryen. Not quite silver gold, but pretty close. 
On the other side, he has red hair, like I describe Sir Jonathan Derry having. Now let's say, for some purposes, that Rhaegar was also glamouring Sir John, just to make sure no one could tell the difference. You wouldn't do for someone on his own side to see that Rhaegar wasn't fighting his own battles. This was probably more for morale on his own side than to necessarily trick Robert. But if Rhaegar was glamouring Sir John, and to take it one step further, if he was even wagging Sir John in the same time, and he was killed during the process, who is to say that Rhaegar didn't end up half and half, getting half John's attributes and half of his own? We know so little about how the glamouring process works. However, Mance Raider, when glamoured by Melisandre, even though Rattleshutters died, his brown eyes keep flickering to Rattleshutters grey and back and forth as the glamour is weakened. This is a particularly incredulous theory of mine, but let's take it a step further and say that Rhaegar squired for Sir John, or at least Sir John played a strong mentorship role in his early life. When he get older and taller, perhaps Sir John, who was absent from many of the great tourneys, in fact rode in Rhaegar's place in all of his tourneys, or perhaps just at the tourney of Hell. A new title, if you accept. It would be good to have you in the field. The competition has become a bit stale. I don't fight in tournaments. No? Getting a little old for it? <laughs> I don't fight in tournaments. Just want to fight a man for real. I don't have to know what I can do. Well said. Perhaps Sir John was concealing his abilities. Rhaegar, after all, told Sir William Daly he needed sword and armour. He didn't say he needed training. Obviously, he would have given it an attempt. The good old college try, as it were. But maybe, for all his practice, he never got to the same level of skill as Sir Arthur and Sir Baustan. So he needed to substitute someone else in his place in order to establish his bona fides as a puissant warrior. Thus, when Sir John makes the heroic sacrifice in Rhaegar's place, it is left to Sir Rhaegar to honour him in some small way, by naming his son, by Lyanna, John. Yes, John Connington is also Rhaegar's friend, but he has much closer friends, like Sir Arthur Dan, supposedly. But if Sir John held a similar mentor role as Duncan did to Aegon V, it could be, however forgotten the histories of Westeros, this little-known Knight of the Kingsguard played a vastly important role, and thusly I present John's real name is in fact John. It just turned out conveniently enough that John Arryn was a plausible explanation for the naming as one of the Eddard sons. So that concludes my series on Jon Snow's real name. Comment down below. I look forward to finding out how I'm totally wrong about this. See you all next time.